All right, Alyssa Clark, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Adam? I'm I'm good. I'm good. Um, it looks like you're in a van. I am. Yeah. So that's a fun life difference. Um, my husband and I have switched to pretty much full time van life, at least for the foreseeable future. And it is awesome. I nice. love having less things and so much more time to go adventure and spend not cleaning up or <laughs> dealing with house issues. So yeah, yeah it's awesome. Totally. And I got to ask, where are you parked right now? I think you're in California. I am. Yeah. So right now we are actually in our friend's driveway in Monterey, California, but we have been bouncing back and forth between um, Lake Tahoe and Monterey and are actually headed back up to Truckee tomorrow. And then we'll be moving just outside of LA for about a month for him to go to a school because he's in the military and then moving to San Diego for three years. So ah. yeah, bouncing around California. So when you are in San Diego, are you still going to be in the van or are you relinquishing the van life? I think we're going to hold on to it as long as we can. Nice. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely, we're really enjoying it. And nice. yeah, and you can probably see my cats. We have two van cats as well. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Is yeah. your husband in the van as well? He is actually outside having some wine with a friend. Um, okay, nice. Yeah. Nice one to give you a little privacy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's so cool. I mean, we have a van too, so I, I understand the attraction to it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of jealous. That's, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, we, so we had a truck camper before and we've, we had always wanted to try it of like, okay, can we, can this be a real thing? Like, can we make this happen? And this was just kind of the right time. And when we bought the actual, like now we have a van, um, that's pretty nicely built out. And that was like, no, this is possible. We can do this. So nice. yeah, it's been did fun. You, did you guys build it out yourself? We did not. We yeah. just, it's so crazy. And I have so much admiration for the people who do build them out, but it is so many hours of <laughs> yeah. effort. Yes. <laughs> so. We didn't build ours out either. So don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> and uh, I live in Colorado and van life is rapidly growing around here and it's expensive to get your van built out. So it was actually cheaper for us to send our van down to Texas and have it built out down there and then sent back. And we still saved just a ton of money. So yeah, yeah. that makes sense. We've got ours from uh, Vegas area. So. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Was it already built out when you bought it or did you guys have it done? It was built out. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It was, okay. it was built out. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. What are the disadvantages to van life? Oh, um, I would say if you like to shower every day, it's probably not for you. Uh, you have to be willing to to be a little bit dirty. Yep. Um, I think you just have to realize that things might take a little bit longer. So in the morning, especially if you're with two people and two cats, making breakfast, getting coffee, everything just takes a little bit longer. But I think that is also the really beautiful part is that you do have to slow down a little bit, but you also have more time because you're not dealing with so many other factors. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little bit more challenging to cook intricate meals. Sure. You just don't have quite as much storage for it. You know, you don't have a stove. Um, but I think it actually is also really great in that regard because you realize you don't like simple eating is also really fun. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um I think too, is that with vans, sometimes it can feel like there's always something that is breaking or you have to fix. And right. so I think just being able to adapt to that and just figure it out. And luckily yep. my husband's very handy uh, and he's, nice. he's a tinkerer. So he's always trying to make things just a little better by hanging hooks here or there. So, nice. um, yeah, I think it's just the making sure you stay on top of the maintenance and sometimes like the toilet breaks and you have poop that you have to deal with <laughs> and you just have to be like this is just what is what it is so, right right yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so cool um it, yeah it looks like you're enjoying the van life so um yeah good for you guys that's really cool um well um yeah brian uh thanks to brian Pacenti for setting up this interview um and I'm just looking forward to talking to you. I've had you on the podcast once before, and it was a great conversation. 
And um, it looks like most recently you ran her 100. I'd like to hear I about did. that. Yeah, you got first place. Um, it looks like second place overall. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, is okay. So I saw you at. I'm just peeking at your ultra sign up right now, which is kind of a nerdy thing to do. But I just want to see what's happening with you. Um, I saw you at Moab 240 last year. And um, I'm going to be completely honest, when I saw, I saw you at, I think it was the first aid station, like we just said before we started recording, and um, I saw you and you were in the lead, but I'm not going to lie, I saw you and you looked a little fatigued, and it's very early on in the race, and I thought, huh, all right, she looks like she's really kind of pushing it almost maybe a little too hard. And, you know, that's to my half-trained eye, you know. Um, did you feel like you were a little too tired? Or, I mean, do you normally push it that hard? Or, like, what was happening for you at Moab? Yeah. that was so, a while ago, too. No, no. I That was honestly, it was such, I, man, every time I think about Moab, it's like, I just want to go back. Um, yeah, it was such yeah. an incredible experience. So it's interesting because I didn't think I was pushing that hard. Uh, it's tricky though, because you're coming off a taper and it is so hard to figure out what does 200 mile pace feel like. Right. Um, I was my, one of my hamstrings was pretty tight. So I was probably looking concerned about my hamstring because mm. I was going, uh Oh, if this lasts the entire time, this is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was probably what was playing in a little bit. And then, it, of course, the hamstring completely went away as Good. generally it does. Yep. Um, I would actually say that I ran the first 50 miles of Moab quite poorly. Mm. Um, and then basically for a mile uh, Indian Creek, so mile 70 something was when my race actually started. Mm. And when I kind of um, got my head out of my ass as a mm -hmm. <laughs> hopefully I can swear. But that... Yes. Um, that happens to me quite often is that I actually hate the starts of races. I love when I get into the meat of the race, sure. um, which is why I like longer races is that I oftentimes get, I feel just really tight and nervous and I am a closer. That's always been my strength. And so yeah. basically if I just don't mess up the beginning of the race, I know that I can get my head together for the latter part of the race. So I am more stressed at the start of races than I am towards the middle and the ending. And so, especially with Moab, what ended up happening um, is that that 22 or so mile section where there was uh, not really any water, right. um, I did not bring it up. I hedged mm. my bets and then I stopped being able to eat. And so I got into oasis and had to lay down i think for like 10 or 15 minutes because i was cramping and definitely uh super dehydrated and um i wish i could remember the head medic's name um he was just like okay you need to hang out here for a while you'll get it back together and i just remember him being like i'm gonna say to him i'm gonna see you at the finish i like i absolutely promise this but i would say that mile 50 was where i probably the worst part of the race and then it just got exponentially better from there nice. like okay so i think it's just that whole thing i think of as such a good lesson that the way that your race starts is not the way that your race ends because i actually had really bad nausea for the first 100 125 miles and then it mm. ended up going away and i had so much fun mm. for the rest of the 100 plus miles left. Awesome. And so I think that keeping the mindset of it, it's going to get better or it can absolutely get better mm -hmm. was such a good lesson for me to learn rather than being like, it's just going to suck the rest of the time. Cause it didn't, mm. it was like, I've honestly never had more fun in a race except for actually now hurt. Um, than I did at Moab. Like every time I look back at that race, I was like, I was living my absolute best life out there like i had the most amazing crew the most amazing pacers i was just having a blast mm. and so um after i kind of got through the first 50 miles but like it was so much fun that's cool um <clears throat> i'm sure it's hard for people to wrap their heads around how much fun you have after the first you know the first 100 mile warm-up and then you know and only 140 miles to go 
Um, I'm curious, I, I believe you're a coach as well. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. a coach as well. <clears throat> um, do you coach yourself? Do you have a coach? And what does your training look like, especially leading up to a 240 mile race? Yeah. So I actually coached at Uphill Athlete with Brian. Oh, um, so that's how I've gotten. Okay. Oh, I also, I apologize. You guys- I was wondering what yeah. the connection was, but that's great. Okay. Yeah, it was so funny, right? He kind of got the job right before Moab, and I'd been working with them um, since August. And uh, we that's where we first met and connected. We're like, oh my gosh, we just finished Moab. So we were actually at the finish line together, uh, hanging out, which was really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I do not coach myself. I actually work with Sean Bearden um, with Science of Ultra Running podcast um yeah he's he's coached me since 2019 so we've had a pretty i guess now she's coming up on um four years or so so we've had a pretty long relationship he's really took me i feel like from a a runner without focus to a runner with focus and um he he pushes me hard like Mm. i i he t- tests me in ways that I wouldn't test myself. So just most recently, we've been doing a lot of double speed days, um, which is risky uh, and is not something I would c- pretty much coach any of my other, any <laughs> of my athletes to do because um, I would be concerned, but we've built such a strong relationship. He knows me so well as an athlete that we're willing to take those risks at this point. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a long time and it's been a couple of times where he's been like, look, you can kind of just keep going along and running some and, you know, probably doing okay, or you have to focus and you have to be committed to a couple of big races and everything defers to training for those races. And you can't just keep adding things in whenever you feel like you have to um, narrow down and not be random. Mm. And so that was a huge wake up call where he was like, you know, I can train you like an amateur. I can train you like a professional. Um, And he said that to me in 2020 and it's been um, really fun to be able to build that because I trust him completely. He also gives me a lot of tough love and that has helped me to grow a lot. Um, but so it's interesting for Moab training leading up to that. So I was actually supposed to race TDS at the UTMB Mm. series and, um, got COVID about two, like in Chamonix essentially. Um, so I did not end up racing TDS, which was pretty heartbreaking because that was one of my huge goal races. I'd really been focusing on that. Um, but it was a blessing in disguise because TDS is, late August and Moab is October. And so instead of having to, which was already a pretty tight turnaround. And so Mm -hmm. instead of having to recover from TDS and then try to put in a really short training block to get to Moab, I shifted to completely focusing on Moab. And I actually think that that helped lead to Moab being more successful. Mm -hmm. Um, And my training, honestly, for a 200 miler is just an enormous amount of time on feet Mm. um 20 to 24 plus hour training weeks where you're going out uh one of our couple of our favorite workouts are like uh most of the time i do take one day off a week but tuesday through friday it's um go out and try to accumulate between four to six hours of running in increments of an hour, 45 minutes. So you're just kind of like, you run, you come back, you do something, you run, you come back. So you're just constantly on your feet, ready to go out for another run. It's like running becomes what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the weekends are six hour runs each. Mm -hmm. Um, So it ends up, yeah, being a lot. And I've been fortunate. Um, I was a, a teacher prior to this, but now I run and coach, uh, full time. And so I do, I feel very, and I, I know this is not the case for everyone. I I'm very lucky that I do have the time to put into this, but when I was teaching, it would mean like getting up at, you know, four in the morning, getting a couple of bits in, in between classes, getting a little bit more. So my students saw me a lot sweaty, um, <laughs> but 
yeah, it's, I think that that's the exciting thing with 200 milers is that we're still trying to figure out how to train for them totally, um, in many yeah. ways, yeah. but uh, my coach really tries to develop me in the mindset that um, basically this is who I am. This is what I do. I run and I don't, you're not thinking about the finish. You're just like existing in the space of running. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that he has, that's, that's the reason behind the, like going out and just running, even if it's not very long, even if it's almost like a run walk, Mm -hmm. it's just running is what I do, Mm -hmm. um, leading up to it. So it's mostly just time on feet. That's the important part. Time on feet. Yeah. And dialing in your nutrition systems, which has taken me a lot of, (laughs) error and yeah, uh, tell, me, tell me about that I'm curious yeah um so I fueled the first 150 miles of Moab pretty much all off of awesome sauce spring energy that was basically and I can tell you that when you eat that much awesome sauce you start pooping green um <laughs> so, <laughs> awesome good to know yeah it's just a little tidbit um <laughs> So that's something I have always really struggled with is nausea and racing. And so um, spring energy has been a huge game changer for me that that is something obviously for Moab, it is really hard to fuel only off of um, a gel, but that is something that I have found I can get down no matter how nauseous, how bad I feel. Um, so that's actually, that was completely my racing strategy for hurt because hurt was only 24 hours, a little bit over 24 hours. So I ate exclusively, um, spring for every 40 minutes I took in a gel and I think I had a sip of potato soup and that was it, um, for hurt. So, and it was super, it's the most effective nutrition strategy I've ever been able to execute and it worked it worked well. So that's something I've been able to dial in. Um, yeah, for Moab, honestly, it, I would say that that was one of the biggest weaknesses. It's something I'd like to improve for the future is that because it got so hot that first day and I did get pretty dehydrated, it just threw off my ability to eat. And so I was nauseous for um, till about a hundred mile, 125. And my pacers were basically just trying to get me to eat anything. My poor pacer, he paced me for 50 miles and he was just like, Alyssa, I'm just going to force you to eat. Like, I really don't care if you have feelings about this or you don't want to, like you're eating this, like this mm-hmm. is non-negotiable. And he was, I like, I owe him my race for just forcing me to get calories in. Cause I was crashing every time, mm-hmm. you know, you just, you, you start bonking. Um, luckily I did start to turn it around uh but basically just like you know ramen seemed to be working pretty well but i i would got so jealous of my pacers because they rolled up and they'd be like yeah give me a case give me this and that and i'd be like i hate you i just want to eat but i can't eat anything so um, and then what's your diet like on the day to day? Um, and do you use th- those spring energy gels on training runs or are you eating real food on training runs? Um, uh, curious what that looks like. Yeah. So I'm, uh, plant-based, so I don't eat any meat products. Um, I've been that way for since 2020, um, and off and on before that. Uh, so I do, I, you know, I, I, I do tend to eat a little bit more real food in my training. I do use quite a bit of spring now just because I know it's effective for me. Um, but it's, it's tough because in training I can stomach a lot of real food. So I love fig bars or something. I eat quite often really gotten into Belvedas, um, are actually really good. (laughs) Uh, and so real food works for me in training. It, it somehow though does not work for me in racing. So I, I'm trying to be a lot more careful about using the feeling that I'm using for racing in my training. Um, so I have been using quite a bit more spring in my training. I've also, um, as I mentioned earlier, been doing more speed work. And so a more real food would be trickier for me to eat with, um, the speed work, but, um, yeah, honestly, Snickers bars are great. Like the little Halloween size ones are awesome. Yep. Um, for training and I do quite a bit of ski touring as well. So for ski touring, 
that's more like we'll bring a peanut butter and jelly sandwich um, or something that's a little bit heftier for the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, nutrition is one of those things that I do feel like it's, it's one of the key pieces of my training that has been missing for a long time. And there, I have been improving it quite a bit, but I think all of us know how every time you think you've gotten a breakthrough in nutrition, something changes and you're completely off again. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's so important. And I used to be quite bad about it because I think for a lot of us, you can get away with doing it almost like a three, four hour run without any nutrition. It, yeah. If, you know, it doesn't feel great, but you can do it. And yeah. it's thinking about it in a more mature way where you're going, yes, I can get away with it, but it's not making me a better athlete mm. and it's not helping my recovery. So that's something personally, I've been shifting my mindset a lot with is that yes, I can get away with it, but is that what's going to make you the best that you can be? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> it's interesting that um, you switched to plant-based, a plant-based diet around 2020, you said, and that was, it looks like that's kind of the start of your success. I mean, that's when you started winning races anyways. It, it, would, you, fair. <laughs> would you attribute it to that? Is there any correlation there, do you think? I never thought about that, but that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's definitely possible. So I also, I have ulcerative colitis, um, which is like Crohn's disease. So I've struggled with diet for a long time. I just like, so I had my colon removed when I was 14 years old. So my yeah. digestive system is, is much different than most people's. Okay. Um, so actually when we lived in Italy from 2018 to 2020, and I really struggled over there, um, just with, I don't know if it's the flour that they use or what was happening, but I just had a lot of trouble. Um, I was sick quite a bit from that. And then moving back to the States, things seem to settle down quite a bit, um, and also, yeah, plant-based, that could very well. It's also, I think plant-based tends to be a higher carbohydrate mm-hmm. diet just mm-hmm. from the nature of getting in the amount of calories. And that probably also helped me as well. Um, I know that, again, everyone's different with diet. Totally. So it's really hard to say. But I do think that um, the shift in plant-based did get me to ingesting more carbohydrates than I might have just because I needed to get more calories in. So sure. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out though. I'm that's like <laughs> awesome to, that's, yeah, I that's interesting. Think of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm all, I'm just fascinated with people's diets and nutrition and what works for you might not work for me or the next person, but I'm always interested in just taking little bits of info from everybody and sort of trying to apply it to my life. But uh, and, and while we're on the topic of nutrition, just to make sure we beat this thing to death, I'm also curious about um, like recovery nutrition. After Moab 240, is it just like pizza and beer or are you mindful about your diet or um, do you worry about recovery diet? That's a great question. Um, honestly, after something like Moab, so it, it's really interesting too, because Wow. Yeah. You're disconnecting so many things. So when I used to do really long races or runs, I would put on quite a bit of weight from swelling. Um, so I would probably put on like five to eight pounds of just like water weight water from weight. muscle damage. And then starting around 2020, I shifted from the water weight to actually like after Moab, I was probably down five to eight pounds. Hmm. Um, so now I lose a significant amount of weight after races. Hmm. And so for me, a lot of it is just getting calories in however kind of I can, Hmm. um, I'm not big on just because of, of the colitis greasy food has never really sat well, um, with my stomach. I don't really eat fast food like that, but pizza is awesome. Like a great Neapolitan pizza or something like that all about that um so yeah and I think too like I do definitely crave fruits and vegetables as well just because you have been eating so much um of that more like process I mean process isn't quite the right word but just you know it has to be efficient um so Yeah. yeah and I 
will say, so I don't drink really much um, at all, especially before big races. I, I pretty much cut al- com- alcohol out completely a month to two months before big events. And so that is a nice part afterwards. I always, my eyes are always bigger than my stomach where I think like, oh yeah, you know, like go have a few drinks. And then I always have one drink and I'm like completely done. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so cheap date, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so- do you have any other secrets or tips or tricks that you use? Like, um, you know, doing like a coffee fat or like a caffeine fast before a race and then incorporating it in the race or, um, you know, visualization or I don't know, meditation or anything else that you use that works for you specifically? Yeah. Um, the alcohol is definitely part of it because I think that you have to signal to yourself. I I don't, take caffeine out. I really like a cup of coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, I am pretty careful about my caffeine consumption in races though. Um, I get a little bit frustrated that so many nutrition systems seem to think that everything should have caffeine in it. And Mm -hmm. it's like, but uh, no, no, thank you. Um, so I do try to be really careful. Luckily spring's really good about not putting caffeine in everything. Um, but yeah. So one of the things that my coach and I have worked on a lot is that a lot of people spend time visualizing everything going right. And we actually spend a lot of time visualizing when things don't go perfectly uh, and how you're going to respond to that. And Mm. so I actually spend a lot of time visualizing things going poorly and Mm. then how I'm going to react and dig myself um, out of it. And so that's been a huge game changer. So he'll often say, okay and it's like exactly what happened in moab okay you blow yourself up for 50 miles how are you going to react to that how are you going to react if you're laying on the ground at mile 50 going i put myself in a hole how are you going to dig out of it and if you don't spend time thinking about that you will get to that point and go i'm done i completely screwed myself over how am i going to run 200 more miles Mm -hmm. when i'm in this spot and Mm -hmm that work has allowed me to figure out how do like, okay, I'm here. I can handle this. I know how to handle this. I practice how to handle this. I'm not, things are not done. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a huge game changer before racing is that it's like, how do you respond when you feel terrible at mile 10 of a 240 mile race? Cause that could happen. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you deal with a low coming sooner rather than later. Um, How do you deal with a high coming sooner rather than later? And so we've really worked on detaching from highs and lows and just watching them happen. Mm. And so it's almost like you're existing out of yourself being like, okay, here's Alyssa going through this experience, but she doesn't have to be attached to either one of them. Mm. She just is existing Mm. and moving along with that. Um, So that's been... I think really helpful because so often with visualization, we focus so much on the finish line of, you know, the glory at the Mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important. And especially I do some mixture of um, kind of mountaineering and trail running and such. And so, and I've also done some things um, solo that are on not uh, risk is a tricky word, but they're, they're not without consequence. So I did, um, the Mount, I would did Lone Pine to Mount Whitney and back down in FKT last year. And I went up the Mountaineers route solo, um, which not very many women do. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time visualizing what happens if I go, what happens if this happens? Mm -hmm. And I actually did go off route and I was in, uh, class five, section and it would have been very bad had I fallen Mm. and I had spent enough time practicing how I would control my mind if that happened that I was able to get myself out of it and feel and not have a panic moment Mm. so Mm -hmm. um yeah you just said it right there control your mind I think that's a huge component that people look over because the mind is very tricky. And especially to newer ultra runners who may have run, you know, half a dozen races or so, when things start to go bad in your mind, it can all fall apart. 
Um, and controlling your mind is possible. It's, it takes a lot of practice, but it is possible. You can, act, you can control your thoughts. And that's something that I don't think really occurs to a lot of people. But um, if it, when it comes to successful ultra running and winning races, I think that that's something you have to look at at some point. It's 100%. I mean, that was going to be the other part that I was going to bring up is that during hurt, I, I sound, it, it sounds insane for me to say this. I did not have a single low during hurt. Mm. I was so happy and so full of joy the entire race. And it's not because there weren't moments where my legs got tired or, you know, it wasn't hard. It was just that I, before any things that would derail me, say, like toward the last 20 miles of the race, I couldn't really stomach any other flavor of spring except awesome sauce. And instead of allowing the fact that my stomach didn't feel as good as it did at the start, I went, oh, cool. I have a contingency plan. I know I can use this fuel and that's what I'm going to use and I'm going to keep going. And I had one moment where it was, the sun was about to set. So I'd been running for 12 plus hours and I went, "Ah, my legs feel a little tired. Like I'm getting like a little bit nauseous. And I went, but how do you feel? I was like, okay, my head feels good. I'm awake. My legs aren't that tired. I, you know, I'm like 60 something miles in, but I feel really good for that much. And my brain's good. I'm happy. I'm with a friend. Like I'm getting to show him these trails. And so I think in in moments in the past, I would have, you could spiral where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to get nauseous. My legs are starting to get tired. The night is coming. I'm going to be so exhausted. Um, And so it's shifting that mindset of how well are things going versus how badly are things going? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's been a huge shift in my running where I focus on what's going well and if something's going wrong, how do I fix it right away? Um, rather than spiraling into, oh no, what do I do? This is not going the way that I expected. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a huge shift, um, in my racing. And a lot of that too, is, is a shift in mindset where I didn't really believe that I was capable of doing, um, what I wanted to do. So, I was always scared of really going after winning Moab or winning hurt or trying to get it to break the course record, because if you never bet on yourself and you never really commit to, to going after it, mm-hmm. then you're, it's not as scary if it doesn't happen because mm-hmm. you can protect yourself. Mm-hmm. And I've spent a significant amount of time. Um, actually it was, it was at TDS that I went on a couple of hikes because I was better from um the COVID and it was in Chamonix was like oh my gosh I'm just gonna go run and hike in the mountains and I there was one day where I was just sobbing because I'd realized I'd spent so much of my life not believing in myself fully and Mm -hmm. it was like I'm never gonna be what I want to be if I'm always sabotaging myself where I can protect the fact that I'm giving my best. So it's like, if you, if you protect yourself, if you're not vulnerable, you'll never be as good as you could be, Mm -hmm. but it's incredibly scary to say, this is what I'm trying to do. This is how I, how good I want to be. Because if you're not that, then it's like, it hurts. And it, it, and I, I have been there, but I'm finally at the point where it's like, who cares? Mm -hmm. Like, just go for it. And yeah. I have so much respect for the people that just go for it. Why can't I be that way? Mm-hmm. And also, why not you? Like, sure. why not? Why can't you do that? Mm-hmm. Stop telling yourself, stop look, looking at other people's results or other people's resumes, because when the race starts, like it's on and mm-hmm. you never know what can happen. And mm-hmm. so that's been a huge shift for me of instead of wondering if I can, it's believing that I can and that Mm -hmm. I put in the time and the effort to be what I know I can be. And Mm -hmm. 
are there going to be hiccups along the way? hundred sure. percent. Are there going to be moments where I have to face the fact that I'm, I am, might not live up to what I think I can be in certain situations? Absolutely. But so far betting on myself has provided me so much freedom mm -hmm. in my racing to really go for it and mm -hmm. to be confident in the fact that I've put in the time, the effort and the training to, to give my best effort and your best effort isn't necessarily winning a race. It's standing at the finish line, knowing that you gave it everything you had. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, that was a long tangent. <laughs> no, no, that's beautiful. And there's a lot to unpack there. And I'm just trying to think of how to do it. Uh, I mean, you strike me as a very confident runner, but you alluded to the fact that you haven't always been that way. So like, give it like give us a recap of like how that how that switched was it just a mental thing that you had to do or was it just through the experience of putting in all these miles and just find just slowly incrementally getting better or what because I feel like that's one thing that a lot of people who are probably listening other ultra runners they just lack the confidence where they say you know I just want to go out and I just want to finish the thing and that's all I want to do and I get that and there's nothing wrong with that that's great but I feel like so many people are missing their potential. And so how were you able to tap into that? Um, I mean, truly it was not until, until that time at, when I was out hiking in Chamonix, just being like, mm. you cannot keep going into races, hoping to come in fourth or fifth because you've already written out the fact that you don't think you can beat these three people. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of it is that I definitely have areas of running where I'm like, yeah, that's my comfort zone. You know, long distance mountainous ultras. I love those. And I know that, um, that they're in my wheelhouse yeah. flat a hundred K's faster races that's really scary to me and so actually um like I almost try to avoid or I was trying to avoid them in order to not face the best because I was afraid what it meant to face the best mm -hmm. um and this year I'm not doing that uh I putting myself you have, uh gorge 100k gorge waterfalls 100k on your list I actually, unfortunately, am not able to do that. I'm doing Istria 100K instead. Ah, okay. um, so a UTMB yep. race, um, also doing Val d'Arene um, ah. 100K. So okay. two, wow. you know, that they're not messing around with those. So that's not um, in your comfort zone. That's it is. And so not. you're willing to take that that chance, you know, and that's what it's all about, right? Is you have to take that chance and this is where I'm not really comfortable. So let's face my demons and just go for it and see what happens. Yeah, exactly. And part of the reason why, and I still get scared. And the other day I looked up what the women in history and was like, oh my gosh, there's like a super fast woman in this. And I went, stop it. You're super fat. Like you mm -hmm. can, you, there's no reason you can't be fighting for that too. Like mm -hmm. it's, so that's kind of been the shift is that I would have just counted myself out. Like I used to stand at the start line and look at the, the people at the start and be like, she's probably faster than I am. She's probably faster than I am. There's no way I can beat that person. They're on the North face team or whatever. And I think so much of that confidence comes from the amount of training that I've put in. Um, I mean, I know that I trained very hard. I put in a lot of time and effort and I'm like, for example, most recently last week in, in a really hard training block, I had a 5k time trial and 5k is so far out of my comfort zone. And <laughs> I've never broken 20 minutes in a 5k, which as a professional runner, it's like, really? Mm. And not that I, it's like everyone, I say this everyone has their 20 minutes or whatever. And I've been working so hard on my self-talk and on my speed that I went and ran in 1834, mm. um, off of already running 50 plus miles that week. And it was a Thursday. Yeah. So, so it's like, you know, that to me was an indication of, you need to stop saying you're bad at this. You need to stop saying you're not capable of taking on 100ks or 
other fast runners because you have put in the time and effort and you deserve to be here too. And so I think it's constantly reminding yourself, you deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that comes from the consistency of effort and training. And I've talked to this a lot. Um, I don't know if you know Steve Houses, but he runs uphill athlete and he's this amazing climber. He's done um, incredible climbs. Like he's basically won the gold medal for climbing. And I think he's really helped a lot too with my mindset where he says, yeah, when I went and climbed um, one of the, these amazing climbs that he got the golden pilot for, he was like, I knew I could do it. And it's not because of arrogance. It's not because um, I thought I was better than the mountain. It was because I had put in the training to know that I was capable of doing that. And so I think when you truly trust and believe in your training, and I was training someone for their first 50 K and I talked to him on the phone before, and he was like, I'm so ready. Like I have put in the effort. I have done the job. I have sacrificed this. And I was like, you're going to crush it. Like I don't, and he got COVID, I think a week and a half before so, or two weeks before. So he wasn't, he was better, but he wasn't in a great you know, it wasn't like he was, had the best lead up to it. He still didn't feel awesome. And we, we were pretty careful about like, "Eh, if you're not feeling good, like please back off. But he was just so, it didn't matter anything else. He just knew he was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't trying to win that race, but he finished it beautifully. And Mm -hmm. so I think so much of that is just confidence in your training and knowing that you've put in the work, because I think that is the most powerful thing you can bring to a start line is knowing that you have put in the work to put your best foot forward and whatever comes up, you can handle it. Yeah. 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 You're right. That's so much of it. Like if you trained a hundred percent and you gave it your all and you followed your training plan and did extra and put all that time in and lost sleep and focused on your diet and your life was focused on this race. And then you get COVID right before the race, you still put your best effort in. you put your best foot forward. And that's as human beings, that's all we can ask for. It's all we can do because you know, shit happens from time to time. Sometimes you can't make it to the start line for whatever reason. Um, where did your um, negative self-talk come from? Like back a few years back or whatever, is that something that you grew up with? Did you have a rough upbringing or um, where did that come from? No. So I have had a very, I had a, a wonderful upbringing. I have, my dad was a triathlete. My mom's biked across the country. Like she's done all these crazy endurance adventures. So honestly, during doing endurance events, like we've biked crazy distances, like hiked all over the place. That was just kind of part of who we were as a family. Mm-hmm. Um, but kind of going back to the, and so I grew up, I was always the, the young kid on the team. So Uh, My big sport when I was younger was lacrosse and um, I would, I would play, I was like a fourth or a fifth grader. I'd be playing with like eighth and ninth graders just Mm -hmm. because first of all, there just weren't that many lacrosse players, but it was like, of course I should be here. And I, when I was a seventh grader, I would run with the high school track team and Mm -hmm. I like, and I would run up with the front people because no one told me I shouldn't be there. It was like, well, but if I can run that fast. Mm -hmm. why shouldn't I be up running with them? And then they got really mad. And then I got asked not to run with the high schoolers anymore because it's not like a seventh grader (laughs) running with them. But I was really lucky in that um, my family always believed in me so much that I, as a kid, didn't feel like I had anyone saying, you don't belong here. I always believed that I belonged where I my ability and my hard work would take me. Unfortunately, um, kind of going back to the colitis portion of it, um, when I was 14, I mentioned that I had my colon removed. I was very, very sick. Um, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I lost a significant amount of weight. Uh, I had to have a blood transfusion when I had emergency surgery to remove my colon. Um, I mean, I, at one point, 
I was laying in the bed right before the surgery and they asked me to stand up to get weighed. And I just thought, I, I can't do that. Mm. I, I can't stand up. Um, and so I went from a, a very confident, just kind of can do anything athlete to um, coming back from that. And that, that involved two surgeries. Uh, I would come in last in races and it really rocked my confidence where I used to be the person that was pushing the lead to the person that could barely finish the, the workout or like, you know, if I came in last by 10 minutes, that was an improvement over the last time that was 15. And so that started this trend where I felt like I had to overcome who I was because the disease took over my life. I mean, it was, it was everything that I was, it was all of my identity. Um, and so I, it set me on this course where I had to prove that I wasn't sick anymore. And that I had to overcome what I used to be. And when I first started running ultras, it was a way to outrun who I used to be. It was a way, um, I had a really big fear of confinement uh, because when you're in a hospital bed, you're, you're very confined. And so mm. I was trying to outrun that fear of confinement. I was trying mm. to, to prove myself to myself mm -hmm. that I wasn't who I used to be. And truthfully, I feel so fortunate because I think ultra running started with a way to run away uh, from my past and it's now become an expression of my gratitude and my love for getting to do what I can do. And it doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's like you should have a colon. That's a huge <laughs> part <laughs> of absorption and dehydration and all that. But I feel so lucky that I get to do this in insane and amazing sport with what I have in um, I remember the first, the, the Hurt 100 was my first 100 mile of race. And I met Nikki Kimball, um, who actually coached me for a little bit. She's a legend. She oh, has, totally. yeah, she's awesome. And yeah. after the race, we like ended up becoming friends and we're driving around the island. And, and she was like, I told her about that. And she goes, oh, every great ultra runner that I know has something like that where and, and I, I I don't know like I like Courtney DeWater seems to be a happy person who doesn't have this kind of darkness um so I don't think it's everyone but I remember her saying that's like nothing is as bad as the worst moment of your life in ultra running and so mm. nothing has been as hard as that time in my life and mm. so ultra running is now it's like you know it, <laughs> nothing in a, in a race can be as hard as that moment and watching my family go through that with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that I was always scared that I, I, I kept that 14 year old who came in last in races and was embarrassed by what she was with me for so long. And so I always have felt like an imposter standing on the start line mm -hmm. um, and always just waiting for the fast person to come and beat me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't honestly see myself as a runner for a very, very long time. Um, and so I think I carried that imposter syndrome with me from from the 14-year-old the Alyssa that, that believed that about herself. Um, and so I think that just recently I've started to come to terms with that it's not that she doesn't exist and it's not and she's so much of the reason why I get to do these things and why I think um I feel so much gratitude in what I do but I'm not I I realized how much shame I carried from that which is a really interesting thing to say and I think I've let that go a lot more. And by letting that go, it's allowed me to to soar, to to be mm -hmm. free of that. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's amazing. When you can take a negative like that or the worst moment in your life and somehow flip it or use it to your advantage. Uh, that's just, that makes life worthwhile, right? Like, um, I just wish I could give that to people that are depressed or that are addicts or that just don't have that and may never see that. Um, because that's just such a beautiful thing and it just makes life so much sweeter. Um, and I, I find it interesting when people find that because it took me kind of a lifetime to find that and I'm old, you know, so, um, like how, how did that just come to you naturally through, um, just living life or were you inspired by something specific or how were you able to start to flip that? Yeah. So what's funny is that running has, I, I was diagnosed when I was at 10, but it got really bad when I was in seventh grade. And running was always my source of freedom throughout any of the illness. Running was actually the thing that I held on to. Um, and so I think that running has always been the thing that's that's been there for me. Sure. And so I think that that uh, like that constant thread and also being a military spouse um, with moving all the time, you kind of get uplifted or like upended a lot uprooted, um, yeah, yeah. uprooted yes all of those things and running again has been the thing that's been mine through all of this um the marathons through covid that was my i did like that was how i stayed sane it was the thing that allowed me to like my friend i mean it really has been one of the best friends of my life um you know i think it's just the beautiful I, I like truly getting older is so freaking cool because well, you agree. realize I yeah agree. it's the best <laughs> i'm 29 and could not be more excited to die. i turned 30 this year and i'm like i'm free i've been waiting for this moment like yeah. i am psyched to be 30 <laughs> and i think it's just that you realize like you make more space for yourself to look at a younger version and go oh my gosh like i'm still holding on to that why haven't I let that go yet? Or why do I still feel shame around who I was at 16, 18 years old? And I'm still letting that impact me. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how, why do I need to keep doing that? Yeah. And so I think that just getting older, getting more comfortable, really finding, I mean, my dream has been to be, a, a full-time athlete and coach um since I was about 22 23 years old and getting to live that dream and I love my life so much um that I think it's the the joy that I have right now from being where I'm at I realized that I wouldn't be here if I hadn't gone through those things and instead of being ashamed of that I'm I'm thankful of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. sense the gratitude. And I think that that's probably another component that makes you successful that a lot of people are missing is, you know, you are happy with your life right now. You're doing what you want to do. You love running. You love coaching. This is something you wanted to do for a long time. And you're truly, truly grateful for it. And I'm guessing you take a few moments, probably almost every day to actually be grateful. And that's a huge part of, getting to the next level in life, to leveling up. And it seems like that's something that you're, you're doing. And I, I mean, it's just, it's so, it's so cool when you think about all of the pieces along the way and all of the people that have allowed you to get to that point. You're like, how could I not be thankful for that? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I think another part of it is that I have always been really lucky to have parents who believe in curiosity and believe that that's a, a crucial piece of how we look at the world. And so my curiosity so often is how, how fast can I go? How far can I go? What happens after 150 miles? How freaking cool is that, that we get to figure that out? Like, how can I do this better? And so I think that curiosity has been, or it's like, what happens if I get to focus more on running? Like how can I get, you know, can I improve in this way? And so 
um that's been a huge factor as well is I just and that's such a that's such a cool part of coaching too as I'm sure you know and you're looking at these athletes and you're like wait okay if we do this and we like help them figure this out about themselves like oh my gosh this is what yeah. we get it goes yeah. beyond running it, it's more like you secretly sort of wind your way into a life coach you know it's like you're you're teaching them bigger lessons that they might not even understand for another few years but through this running thing you're using it as a vehicle to help people be better people in the long run and you're right it's just so rewarding it is and i love that with coaching we get to help people with the most vulnerable sides of themselves so when you like how many people have a dream of climbing everest or have a dream of running 100 miles and they're too afraid to tell the people that they love or their friends or anything about that dream because so often we get told about our dreams especially childhood dreams even that's not realistic like what are you thinking you're crazy you shouldn't try to do that you'll hurt yourself mm -hmm. and we get to be those people that they confide in and we get to believe in them and help mm -hmm. them reach that goal and like man is that a cool mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. like, it's the best yeah like really they is. they give us the gift of their vulnerability and with that there's so much responsibility but wow is it cool mm -hmm. to know that we might be the only people who know about this goal and we're going to help them get there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <sighs> I want to hear about her. Okay. Okay. I know it was a oh, couple man. months ago. So you've had a couple months to reflect. And like, so it's been also coming off of Moab 240. You know, this is a race that's half the distance. It's only 100 miles, right? Um, so having that confidence from running 240 miles and running it really, really well does that just like give you confidence to the nth degree with hurt or in like, how did you approach this whole thing? I just want to hear it all. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was a really interesting, it was an interesting challenge. Um, so it's funny the way that it came about, I had, I had always wanted to do hurt again. It was my first hundred miler. Uh, I just, I felt like I could do it better. I lived in Hawaii for three years. I really wanted to go back. Uh, and so I was in my room in Chamonix, not being able to do TDS and the hurt lottery was happening and I didn't get in off the lottery. And I was like, Oh, you know, whatever, like no big deal. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle of the night, I get an email that says you've been board selected to do hurt. And I just went, wow mm. i have to do it mm -hmm. like i i love the hawaii trail running community and they they're my family that like they still message me all the time and really? support me like they've they've supported me from day one and believed in me from day one and so that gift of we want you to we want you here we want you back was just immense and i you know race in january is tricky it's mm -hmm. it's a really weird time big time and it, this was in august and i said to my coach like hey i got into hurt like what do you think I said to my husband hey i got into hurt what do you think and they're both like not a great idea like i don't think you should do it you're coming off of moab like you're that's not a super long training cycle we know you're gonna want to race it hard um we always do this big ice climbing trip because we're also big winter sports people and my husband's like great you're gonna be training for hurt like come on and i was like nope it won't interfere everything will be fine <laughs> right yeah I ended up doing many five-hour trail runs or five-hour runs on a treadmill in bozeman montana when it was negative 35 oh wow um so <laughs> yes it did slightly interfere with ice climbing but i just knew i had to do it i was like mm -hmm. there is this is this is it like i know it um i truly didn't I knew that I, my training would not be perfect because it's just not a lot of time. Um, you're really only getting in about like two quality months of training mm -hmm. and hurt is a lot different than Moab. I mean, hurt is super technical. It's in, you know, like the dry heat versus the humidity. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it's just a much different race. But I figured that my my course knowledge, so I ran hurt loops like every other day when I was training for hurt the first time. I know every inch of that course, uh-huh. like the back of my hand. And so I figured that that would help me. Um, one of my best friends is moving to Hawaii. Her husband already lives over there. So like they were going to crew me. I had, it was just like the perfect, everything was just like kind of perfectly set up um, for it. But no one had ever gotten under 25 hours um, in a while. And the course has changed quite a bit. There's been years of just not great conditions. And so I have always in the back of my head been like, I would like, I want to break 24 hours so badly. I like, it's been so long. I think the records from 2012 or 2014. And so I was just like, I want to, Mm. to go after it as Mm -hmm. much as I can. Um, and so that was in the back of my head. And I went into the race, just like, I was so happy to be back in Hawaii because it was, it was, it's where I fell in love with ultra running. It's where Mm. I found my community. It's where I did my first hundred miler. So I just, I stood on the start line being like, how could I not be happy? Mm. I'm around people that I love, like everyone that I knew from Hawaii is like, running the aid stations or out on the course and they're just Mm. cheering for you like you're like you you've never left and so that just immense love like there's Mm. just so much love there you're like how could I not give my best effort Mm -hmm. and just be so grateful to be here and so um I just like I went into it with that mindset And I went, I mean, I went aggressively. So I probably did not spend more than a minute in any aid station when I would get to um, the main aid station at mile 20, because there are loops. Mm -hmm. I, my crew literally had my entire pack ready and just handed it off to me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was playing the fine line game um, of how hard can I push? And the, the tricky thing with her is that you can run a great three laps and then completely blow yourself out of the water for four and five. And so I felt good. Um, that it was, I mean, it's perfect conditions, like does not get any better than what mm-hmm. I had, which that really helped a lot. Um, but on the fourth loop, well, on the third loop, I started catching more of the men's field and was like, Oh, okay. Like this is, interesting I wasn't kind of expecting that but um I was really concerned that if I blew myself up on the second half of the third loop or the fourth loop it would cause a lot of issues uh and also I kept saying to myself it's like it's amazing to run a good 60 miles but it it doesn't really matter if you run a good 60 miles in a 100 mile race if you don't run the last 40 miles well Mm -hmm. so I kept saying like hold it together hold it together On the fourth loop, um, I moved into second overall and I did slow down quite a bit on the fourth loop. And it was really tricky because I wanted to go after the course record and I I like really, really wanted to beat it. And I was ahead of the course record pace until I think loop four. Um, But then I started trying to play the, the game of cost and benefit of if I push, I risk injury. I risk blowing myself up because I still have 40 miles left. I risk now second overall. Like, how do you find that balance? And going into the fifth loop, I would have had to absolutely redline it and risk those things even more. And my patient and I talked about it and I, it's not that I wasn't pushing hard. It wasn't that I wasn't trying really hard, but we decided that it, didn't make sense to potentially risk what I had right there to blow myself up with 15 miles to go and have to walk it in and lose second overall, lose the women's win and all of that. Um, So I ended up missing the course record by 30 minutes, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was so much fun. It was just uh, like, 
the whole time is like, how could I not be having this much fun being in the place that I am, the place mm-hmm. that I love, surrounded by people that I love, just absolute gratitude the entire mm-hmm. time. And like I said, I didn't have a single low because there was just, it was like, there was almost no reason to, it's like, I was just having a blast. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that I can either go back and maybe get under 24 hours or that I've inspired someone else to go after it again. Cause I actually had someone come up to me and say, you made it possible again, that a woman could go under 24 hours because for a long time, we weren't really sure if that was going to happen I was like oh no it's gonna like someone's gonna do it and Mm -hmm. she had said to me like you opened the door up again that this is right here and a woman can do this and that meant so much to me of Mm -hmm. just um creating that possibility because I I 100% believe that a woman can go under 24 hours and that it's probably going to happen and not too long Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. yeah well, congrats, uh, regardless, Thanks. course record or not, it sounds like uh, just an amazing time. And like, um, that's your place, you know? It sounds like you're in love with the spirit of that place and you knew everybody there. And so like, how could you not go out and just enjoy that? So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, you talked a little bit about upcoming races. What does your future look like? Do you think like three, five years down the road? Do you look that far ahead? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh man. Um, yeah. So this year I am working a bit more. I kind of flip speed and longer distance a little bit. Um because I am on the younger side and speed is kind of the low hanging fruit for me of what I can improve upon. And so I think if I can continue to improve my speed, then I can continue to improve my longer racing. Um, I am doing Istria 100 K Valderrain 100 K and then dragons back race in Wales, mm, wow. uh, which I attempted back in 2019 and actually DNF'd on the fourth day. So there is, mm. I am psyched Redemption. for that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, and then, you know, kind of right now the the big, I kind of have two years and I don't know how they're, how they're going to line up. I haven't decided which is going to be which, um, yeah. but I want to do the triple crown. Um, mm. Mm. I have some big goals for that. Nice. For sure. Sweet. Yeah. And then um, the other kind of double that I want to do is Cocodona and Tour de Jean. Ah, uh, Okay. Um, Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I've attempted Tour de Jean twice and DNF'd. Um, and I needed to gain a lot of maturity. So I think probably that after this year will be the triple, and then the year after that will be Cocodona and Tour. Uh, but yeah, that's those are kind of the two big s- sets of years that that I um have on my radar. Cool. So I mean. You're kind of a slacker, you know. I mean, you should probably step it up a little bit and look at bigger races. <laughs> I mean, well, they're certainly longer. <laughs> it's highly ambitious and very impressive. Uh, well, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm a fan of your running, but uh, more so, I really enjoy your spirit. Like you, uh, you just embody like the um the ultra runners that i want to see out there i guess um your your gratitude and and everything it just it goes a long way and i just like listening to you and you yeah you got good spirit so keep doing what you're doing whatever you're doing keep it up (laughs) thank you and i appreciate all that you do for the sport because i think you fill a really needed and helpful part of of the community that uh we haven't really had so i i think what you're doing um, is just awesome of, of giving support to runners that don't necessarily have that. And that's such a barrier to entry. So keep doing what you're doing. It's, yeah, it's really you. awesome. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, do you have anything you want to plug? I mean, if someone wants to find you as a running coach, or do you want to talk about uphill athlete or anything else we can send people to? Um, I mean, yeah, if you want to see what I'm doing, I'm very in motion on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have my hands in a lot of things that uphill athlete uh so 
um, on the Apple Athlete website. I am one of the co-hosts and the producer for the podcast. Um, I am involved in some of the training groups. I coach, uh, I run um, part of the tactical side of things that we're developing. Uh, so yeah, just kind of all involved with that. Um, and really one of my big missions is to get, um, more women out into mountain sports in particular, into mountaineering, into longer trail running and kind of even that, um, percentage out. So building Mm -hmm. female community, um, is really important to me. So yeah, I'm here to help answer any questions as you can see i love talking about running mountains any of all that so um yeah please feel free to reach out real quick where would you be without running do you have any other interests oh yeah i actually think about this a lot to make sure that i stay grounded um i am a huge shakespeare nerd i actually have a tiny bust of shakespeare uh that (laughs) i've carried around with me for a while wow Um, okay so yeah i love reading Shakespeare. I was an English teacher. So I really, um, love reading, writing. That's actually a really fun part of Uphill Athlete is I get to do quite a bit of writing. Um, I have an unpublished book sitting in Google docs that one day, maybe it will get out there. Um, About your life and about running. Yeah. It's, it was, it's kind of focused on the marathons, um, 95 marathons in 95 days, Ah, um, that I did during, during COVID. That's right. Um, yeah, just kind of figuring out where to go with that the next step. That's what your um, whole book that's what the whole book is about? No, it's it's intermingled kind of with the Kaleidos story and okay. all of all of that. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, yeah. Sweet. Uh, yeah. That's cool. And I then like that. Yeah, Cat Mom, General Mountain Sports. Yeah. Um actually I was an art major, so I love nice. drawing. I love yeah kind of the creative side of things. And I'm actually, I'm a huge nerd. So (laughs) (laughs) Um, favorite authors, since you're an English teacher, Uh, you mentioned Shakespeare and I know it all kind of goes back to Shakespeare. Um, But any, anybody else that you are into that most people uh, might not know that particular author, like I'm a fan of a lot of authors from the like late 1800s, early 1900s. And I try and talk to other people about those authors and they're like, I never heard of them. Yeah, I mean, truly, Shakespeare is one of my greatest loves. It's funny wow. to say. Um, yeah, like Othello is probably one of my favorite books okay. in general. Yeah, um, yeah I, oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, Toni Morrison's amazing. Mm-hmm. I really love biographies, though. I've been really interested in, uh, I just read Coward Goucher's book, Oh, yep. Um, as well as, uh, Lauren Fleischman's, I think that those are incredible for a female running communities. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, I haven't done as much of like the classical reading. I can tell you, I don't love, um, Frankenstein. <laughs> That's one Very of my least favorite books. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never been into the kind of dystopian, side of things i love jd salinger he's pretty incredible yep. uh nice. i mean f scott fitzgerald okay. like it's yep. hard to beat gatsby yeah. yeah 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 i love that era of literature personally um that's kind of my style um jd salinger that's my dude oh that's that's one of my favorite guys oh the first time i read catcher in the rye it was just like how did you create a character that I can see my, like, I'm so different from, but I see myself so clearly in. Yeah. So many people felt that way. Yeah. Yeah, That's interesting. Um, I'm trying to think, and this is silly of me, but JD Salinger passed away, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And supposedly he had just tons and tons of writing that no one had ever seen, like that he, he, you know, he was a, ended up being a reclusive, writer and wrote all this stuff and didn't publish anything else and i'm still waiting for all that to come out we'll see if it ever does but yeah that's one of my guys yeah oh he's awesome have you ever heard of uh the poet mary oliver mary oliver i have not okay there's i highly recommend looking her up there's an amazing poem called in blackwater woods and the last few lines have uh played a big part in my life for a long time well let's look it up that'd be a good way to close this thing out 
I um, actually, I pulled her up. Um, okay, sweet. Let, read it for us. I want to hear this. Okay. Let me... We're loading. Actually, one of my students um, that I was very close with, she graduated last year and I wrote the last few lines of this and gave it and framed it and gave it to her as a present uh, because I feel like it kind of embodies so much of what we should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, but the last line is, or the last few lines, to live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Dang. Wow. That's some mic dropper. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. Okay. Alyssa Clark. There it is. That's a, that's the great, that's a, that's the best way to wrap this thing up. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast and chatting with me again. Super, super interesting. I enjoy it. Um, yeah. Like I said, keep doing what you're doing. You're badass. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate All right. it. We'll see you on the trail sometime. For sure. Cool. All right. Have a great night. We'll see ya. See ya.